Hello and welcome back to Guillotine Chemistry. This is the fourth video in our Nature of Science series, help build up your scientific literacy. Again, these are rough videos, but if you like what you see, let me know and I'll try to redo these with a bit more pizzazz later. And so before we talk about inferences today, and we give examples of the three main types of inferences, I thought it might help to review what observations are. Remember that an observation is information recorded from the natural world, at least in the scientific sense. This is essentially what we call data. These are directly observable to the senses and objective in nature. Everybody should be seeing the same thing. Uh, you can certainly have aided or unaided observations, but these are often considered scientific facts because if you've taken good observations, we are all going to agree with the same thing in the same situation. And so an inference, on the other hand, is what many people call an indirect observation. And that's the idea that you're making a conclusion based off premises that are assumed to be correct. Um, these are not directly observable, and therefore they're open to subjective interpretation. They have values added to them. And so, for instance, uh, an observation might be that an apple fell from a tree, while the inference would be you know, gravitational forces attracted the apple to the ground or there are invisible fairies that occasionally pull apples from a tree and then take them down to the ground. <laughs> you know, those are both explanations. And so there are three types of inferences. And the first one is called deduction. And that's the idea that we take some general premises and then move to a specific conclusion. This is often called top-down logic. And the strength of deduction lies in the fact that if your premises are correct, then by default, your conclusion has to be correct. And so, for instance, if things denser than water sink uh, and rocks are denser than water, then the deduction would be that rocks sink in water. A sillier example of this would be, um, you know, Frank is bald. Dads are bald. So Frank is a dad. <laughs> now, that obviously shows some of the flaws of a bad premise. If your premise is wrong, then your deduction will be wrong. The idea of rocks sinking, you could think of pumice. Pumice floats. The next type of inference is called induction. And that's the idea that you can collect a lot of specific observations and then reach a general conclusion. This is often called bottom up logic. And so this is really your experience eventually leading to some, some overarching sort of conclusions. So if you were to drop a bunch of rocks into water and every single one of them sunk, you might reach the general conclusion that all rocks sink in water. Now, unlike deduction, induction cannot guarantee that your conclusion is correct because you're always overstepping your data. For instance, you could, you could drop 20 million rocks into the water, but unless you test every possible rock, there's always a chance that you're gonna find a rock later that would float. And the, again, the example we brought up before is pumice. Um, so that's why inductions are often stated in terms of some kind of probability. You know, even though you've done this many, many times, there's a chance there could still be something out there that isn't within your inductive conclusion. And finally, the last type, and probably the most important type of inference in science is the abduction. This is what we all do all the time. And that's the idea of finding a hypothesis or theory to account for the observations. Um, so this is often called inference to the best explanation. If you hear a noise outside of your window, then you're probably gonna do abduction to try to figure out what that is you're gonna come up with the best possible explanation of why that sound is out there, whether it's a raccoon or some kids playing basketball or something like that. So an example of abduction might be that if this rock floats on water, I, I, need, I need to figure out why. And so a reasonable explanation is that it must be less dense than water. There could certainly be other reasons why it looks like that rock is floating in water. But nonetheless, that's what abduction is all about. What's the best possible explanation? Now, like induction, since we're moving from specific to general ideas, there's no guarantee that your abductive reasoning is correct. But again, it's arguably the cornerstone of all scientific endeavors because it's this idea of coming up with a testable explanation that is the cornerstone of experimentation. By the way, one fun fact, uh, Sherlock Holmes, often called a master of deduction, really wasn't doing deduction all the time. Often he was doing abduction. You know, he would take uh, very detailed observations and tie it into a massive content knowledge so that he could then come up with really good explanations. More interestingly, Sherlock Holmes was inspired by one of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's uh, 
famous teachers, a, a surgeon named Dr. Joseph Bell, who often deployed the same uncanny skill set on his patients when he diagnosed them. So fun fact about Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> anyway, hope you enjoyed this. And uh, we'll see you next time for, I think, the scientific method, which ties in nicely to inferences. Thanks for watching and have a great day.